ladies, again, congratulations on this wonderful film. Again, we have to give another round of applause. So for the sake of time, uh, Lisa and, and Farah, how did you make the decision to work together on this film? Uh, Hillary Cutter, our co-producer. Where's Hillary? Uh, hey, Hillary. Hillary's right hey. here. Um, I said, you know, there was a need. I, I produced another film at the same time, the Apollo Theater Doc. And I was like, I can't do this. I need someone incredible. And Hillary went into her magic bag and said, I have someone incredible, and that's Farah. And that's how we came together. Awesome. Yeah, we awesome. had actually never met before we decided to work together. So it was really an amazing experience. Awesome. Capricorn power. Hey. Three Capricorns. There's three Capricorns. Wow, that's a lot of energy. Another Capricorn? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so remarkably, 90% of the crew were women. Why was that important? And what did you do differently than other directors in Hollywood? Why shouldn't that be anything different than who runs the world? Right? Right. Uh, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> it, it, it shouldn't be an anomaly for us anymore um, to, to say, like, why? Because they were the best people to do this. And, like, we started all this, didn't we, ladies? <laughs> With a little help from our wonderful brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so, Misa. Yes. So, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am from New York. And if you're from New York and you're as old as I am, there was a time when there was no YouTube and there was no phone. So the only way you could consume your hip hop, was, and I didn't have cable growing up. So after school, I came home one day and it was 1994. And I was watching Video Music Box, Channel 31. Who in here from New York know what I'm talking about? Cassie, if you see Brooke, Brooke knows what I'm talking about. And I remember seeing the Juicy video by Biggie Smalls. And I remember seeing this blonde bombshell in the video holding the cutest baby I'd ever seen in my <laughs> life. So I couldn't Google, who was that lady? And for years, I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, who was she? I was just so enamored by her beauty. But how she just, she, not just because her hair was blonde, but she just had this halo of energy around her. And I said, who is that? And later on, I saw her with Mary J. Blige and just saw what she was doing as an image architect. And I was stunned and just taken back by Misa. So number one, I'm standing for Misa 100%. I <laughs> have you. loved you since 1994. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations on everything that you've accomplished. You so so how did the MCM relationship come to be? And at what point as an entrepreneur did you feel it was OK to work with another brand of that magnitude? Hmm. Well, one day the stars began to align for me <laughs> in the most magical way. And it started with a meeting with Lisa Cortez and Emil Wilbekin. And um, they were interviewing me to be part of the film. Lisa thought that I would be perfect for the film. And she told me that she wanted, she called me later that evening and was like, I actually need- We were in a snowstorm. <laughs> we were in a snowstorm. Okay. She was like, I actually need a guide for the film and I want you to be it. And I'm like, what? Oh my God, me? So we had our moment. I was so happy and emotional about um, being able to be about, be, uh, be included in something so powerful. And uh, one day I was getting my nails done and a friend of mine, uh, uh, Mike Daddy from Mount Vernon, he texts me and he's like, uh, Rita Shukman from MCM would like to speak to you. So I'm like, absolutely, okay. give her my number. <laughs> <laughs> and so she texts me and uh, she wanted to meet with me and I said, sure. Came up to her office, long story short, she wanted me to design for Rhapsody, Ninth Wonder, and Big Daddy Kane. Nice. Rhapsody's here today. Hey, Rhapsody. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I made uh, you know, custom design pieces. You see the Big Daddy Kane uh, trench, motorcycle trench. And uh, Zarina saw, um, oh, the question was how did I start to work with MC? I'm about to tell a story about that. <laughs> so, um, so Rita, you know, we met and it was, you know, we just started to build this amazing relationship. And um, it was just, like I said, the stars began to align for me. So it was like success after success, connection after connection. It was total alignment and, um, you know, I felt like I loved MCM, I related to them, I grew up with MCM, I loved the heritage, I loved everyone that works at the company and what they stand for, and that's rare in this business, to feel so at home and to feel so welcomed, and they knew so much about the culture I came from and about me and my work, so the connection was there, and as far as feeling like a brand of that magnitude, 
I feel like I was always a part of MCM. In my mind, you know, I grew up with MCM bags. I grew up admiring MCM fashion and pocketbooks. My aunt had those, my aunts had those bags and stuff like that. So I didn't feel like they were, I just felt like I was family already in my mind because I knew everything about them as well. That's a great feeling. How many entrepreneurs do we have in the room? Okay, so you had to pivot. Um, so when did you feel when did you feel like you were making the right decision though because you had worked so hard to create your own brand and mm -hmm. how did you know that this was the right time I know you said the stars were aligning but you know you were already putting respect on your own name how did you not how did you make a good decision to say look I don't I can still maintain who I am as Misa Hilton but also work with a brand like this. I think that's automatic and that's always been who I've been mm -hmm. in any situation. So that, that doesn't change because it was MCM or anyone else. So okay. I, I'm always myself. I'm very authentic. They'll tell you. <laughs> and um, I believe in myself. I believe in my ideas. And so I didn't feel like it, I didn't show up thinking anything other than that. And, and the fact that Rita wanted to meet with me, she was interested in me. Awesome. And so. All right. Is Rita yeah. here? Hey, Rita. Yay. And we want to say a special thank you to MCM for allowing us to, uh, to screen the film today. Great. So, Farah, you worked with Beyonce. Shout out to the queen. It was her birthday this week. Uh, <laughs> Mariah Carey, J-Lo, and Prince. You've seen the process of styling videos and making them before the creation of this film. Were you aware of the issue of compensation, ownership, and cultural appropriation versus appreciation in streetwear and fashion? I was only aware of cultural appropriation before okay. this. This documentary was a complete learning experience in how poorly embraced the culture actually is in terms of compensation. Um, I, I mean, for me, my first experience with cultural appropriation was I, I got my start as a fashion model and I went on an audition when I was like 18 in Paris for a runway show of a big designer and his entire show was based on Indian culture. I'm Pakistani, but you know, Indian, same blood. Right. Um, I looked around the room, there was maybe one other brown person auditioning, a couple of black women, and the rest was all Caucasians. The entire show ended up being Caucasian women in complete Indian styled garb. And that to me was just the biggest blow. And I realized that there is a bigger battle that I'm up against, and that was the, the, the whiteification of every culture. Oh, and that's a new one. <laughs> okay. um, so that's, that was my experience. So coming into when, I, when we started exploring the story of this film, it really resonated with me because of my experience in the past and seeing that it's, it's done with, a, oh my, I don't want to say every culture, with many cultures across the board that the essence is kind of taken out and profited on, but the credit is not given back. And that's where it becomes an issue. So um, to Farah's point about a lesson, Lisa, what was the um, most important lesson you had to learn that had a positive effect on your film? Like what, um, how did that lesson happen? Most important? What was the most important lesson you had to learn that had a positive effect on the outcome of the film? Um, how hungry people were for the story and how open and supportive they were of sharing with us. Like the range of people who were in it are all really busy people and they did not get paid to be in it and they just said, what can we do? How can we support? Because we wanna make certain that our voice and the truth is put out there. Right. So I think that, that was just su such a edifying thing uh, to, as we put this together. And did you, create, did you run into any roadblocks in creating the film? Oh, there's always roadblocks, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We got it done. And, and we're having a good time with it. Okay. And, um, and uh, we, we hope that when audiences see it, that you start to think and that hopefully you will be elevated, you will be educated, but most importantly, that you will have empathy yeah. for how things are created and who is creating them and the intention that's behind it. So, I mean, you know, I've done a lot of films, had a music business career. Can you but, name some of the films you, you, you've done, uh, Lisa? Precious. Oh, heard of that uh, one before. Mm -hmm. Monster's Ball, mm, okay. Woodsman. <laughs> um, but the most, my, the one I love the best, mm -hmm. and that's the most personal, is the remix. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Nice.
Nice. So, Misa, I'm sure you've seen a lot of, over the years, working in hip-hop and fashion. As a woman working in both industries, what is your biggest piece of advice that you have to offer to women? Uh, to be unapologetic, uh, to be yourself, to believe in yourself, and to know that you matter and your voice matters, and there's no shrinking back ever. And so we find ourselves in rooms and at tables that, we, that women could have never sat at back in the day, right. even when I first started. And so that is a testament to how powerful we are, the value that we add to projects and corporations and everything that we touch in every place that we enter. Awesome. And so we have to own that. So that's why I say believe in yourself. I say that so many times. I've said it in Korea. I've said it throughout the film. I've said it around the world to millions of people. Believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. And as a woman, it's even more important because people will try to make you feel like you shouldn't be there and someone else should be there. Like a man should be in this position or... Um, you know, that you don't deserve it. So if you believe in yourself and you have that confidence and you know what you bring to the table and you're clear about who you are, you already won. Great. Um, Farrah, what do you want young aspiring designers and filmmakers to take away from this film? Um, I think it's pretty much what was just said. One, to believe in yourself and your craft and your passion. And especially female filmmakers, don't shy away don't let people tell you you are not valued or not good enough or your opinion doesn't matter. And um, I think, I mean, that's it, just to be in, inspired to, to have your voice and to get it out there into the world no matter how hard it, it is to do so or how long it takes to do so. Cool. Let's talk about diversity and inclusion. So last year at um, Fashion Week, it was a huge story. We talked about, um, I remember being here last year and the whole, um, Gucci turtleneck had just come out and the Prada doll had just come out. And since then, um, we've seen initiatives such as the historic collaboration between um, meeting between Dapper Dan and Gucci to work on diversity and inclusion intentionally. How do you feel like the examples in the film continue to push the needle for change? And why is the change so needed, again, in, in the fashion industry? That's right. I mean, mm -hmm. I think just the fact that we're here this, to this year, if last year we were dealing with those issues with Gucci, this year we're here at Fashion Week having this conversation. That's, that's one of the main things to me right now is, is it's like, and thanks to your support constantly, that we can be here and have the conversation about diversity and inclusion. So I remember, well, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you know, for every two steps forward, there's still a Dior Sauvage ad, right? you know, which I think is disrespectful to the Native American community. So, it, you know, there's a lot of creative people. I know there's, we have a lot of design students in here. I think you have to look at your teams. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're not just selling to people who look like you. Uh, you're selling to the world. You're selling to a diaspora. Um, and, to, and it's worth it to go spend time with people and um, learn about other cultures and solicit ideas. And, and come to people like Amisa Hilton and say, like, you're, you've had an effect all over the world. You know, what, how can we move forward? I mean, that, that is legitimate, true collaboration and, and dialogue. Yeah, I, I agree um, with both Lisa and Farah. And I think that we need to be a part of conversations and we need to be at the table. Like, we have to be included. And that, that really will solve the problem. That will begin to make a difference and I know that um, there are a lot of surface things that have been done. To me, I see them as surface, but it's a start. Yeah. But the real um, change will happen when we have more uh, people of color and different backgrounds in places of, uh, in positions of power and decision making. And do you, do you feel like there's any indication that you know there's major change in the industry at what point? Do you know like, do you feel like you, what would be an indicator that things have really changed in the fashion industry? Seeing, is it more models going down the runway or what do you think it is? More models of color, what do I, you think? I think it's when it's not even a topic of conversation anymore. Right. Right. When we're not talking about an all female crew or we're not talking about needing people of color, when it's just the norm. Awesome. So Farah, um, 
I remember reading an article uh, in March. It was Biggie's birthday, and I remember it saying, happy birthday to Biggie. He's from Clinton Hill. And, and anybody who knows Big, where Biggie's from, Biggie's from Bed-Stuy, right? So he's not from Clinton Hill. He's from Bed-Stuy. So um, in the film, uh, April Walker said, we create culture, but we do not participate in the longevity of it. You live in Brooklyn a landscape that has changed so much and lost culture over the years, yet has given so much to hip hop. What is your advice on keeping hip hop from becoming the next gentrified neighborhood? That is a very difficult question for me because <laughs> I am new to Brooklyn relatively, okay. seven years, so I am part of the gentrification problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can be new to something, but so we can I mean, get very political about yeah. what gentrification is right now. But you know, it's again a cultural. It's appropriation versus mm -hmm. um, appreciation and in um, cultural integrity. So we we'll still want your perspective on that. Um, so how to keep hip hop from gentrifying? Yeah, because you've worked in hip hop. Yeah, I, I'm really not sure I have an answer to that question. Okay. I was thinking about it mm -hmm. earlier, and I'm. I think it's it's up to the people who are core in hip hop. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I have a, a history in hip hop in terms of editing and directing music videos, but these ladies next to me are the ones who have their root and their core in hip hop. Okay. okay. I got an answer. Yeah. Rhapsody has a new album out and it's incredible. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's a great answer. Baby, baby. No, awesome. no, no. But it's, it's heartfelt and it's real. Yeah. And it is so like important what she has done with this album to elevate the role of women awesome. as change makers, as nurturers of holders of the light. And um, that's not easy to do in the music industry in, in, with the authenticity and, and illest rhymes out there. So. Great answer, Lisa. So go out and go get that rap to the album. Tweet, yeah. 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 out okay. right now. <laughs> so, Misa, this one's for you. In the film, it's evident that relationships are very important. Bevy Smith, Little Kim, Missy, Mary J. Blige are all clients and longtime friends. How have you been able to maintain that? And what's your secret to creating community? Um, honestly, I don't think it's a secret. I'm just... Well, everybody ain't doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> What I do is um, I connect with my clients in a real way, and I'm not trying to change them or make them into someone they aren't. I'm looking at them and who they are and their art and elevating it and bring it to, bringing it to life. And so I'm sort of an interpreter, translator of the culture and of everything in their mind. And so when you work with someone who is paying that much attention and that is engaged in that way, it's natural that a close relationship is going to begin to form awesome. because it's so easy. And this, uh, in fashion especially, it's so surface and it's so... Um, everything is so flighty and about what's hot, what's not, and what you should be doing, and people really engage in a way that's meaningful. Awesome. So um, I think that's what makes us not only friends, but at this point we're like sisters. Right. And so us sticking together and going through the things that we've gone through um, have brought us closer, and we change fashion, and we change so many things, and we paved the way for other people to come forward behind us. And so having that experience together bonds us forever. Awesome. So again, for you, Misa, you run the Misa Hilton Fashion Academy, where one can channel creativity and business savvy into fashion education. I believe we have a fashion school in the house, right? A college? What school are you from? Are you all from one school? Oh, so we have many schools. OK. How are you preparing students of color to deal with the racial divide in fa fashion and navigate the waters the way you did? I think it's about, um, you know, sharing stories, but also um, not being af afraid to give them that knowledge and to pass on the wisdom and also it, make sure that they understand the business side of what we're doing. And I think even more importantly than that, to be confident. So once you have the knowledge, once you have the skill set, once you understand the history of people who came before you and what the fashion styling business is really about and how fashion is different, fashion styling is different in different areas. Like you have advertising, you have uh, celebrity fashion styling, runway fashion show styling, you have uh, film. There's so many avenues of fashion styling that you can go down. So understanding the difference in those and um, making a choice from a place of power. So. You know, for me, it's about arming them with everything that they need 
so that they have that confidence and that they stand in their power and are able to walk through those doors. That was a word. Amen. Okay. So, um, Misa had a, she looked up in Times Square in the film and she had her I Made It moment. So Farrah and Lisa, what has been your greatest achievement to date? Or should we say stay tuned? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's hard to answer that question because there's so many different levels of achievement. You know, one, one would be just finding that, I don't know if it was a moment or a series of moments when you finally hear your own voice and understand that this is who I am and not be apologetic about it. Right. I think that's a huge achievement because that will move you forward and propel you in anything else you do. Um, you know, career-wise, there's always, like, for me, one of my greatest moments was premiering this film at Tribeca this year. That was one of the best days of my life. That's, that's the Times Square-worthy <laughs> moment. That was the Times Square <laughs> moment. But I think, I, I mean, the way I see life and living is that we always are achieving the next greatest thing and the next best thing and just having the joy of, of life itself is, awesome. that sounds very spiritual, but it's true. <laughs> sounds good to me. Well, what everyone should know about this film is that things happened organically during the course of filming it. You know, we had the party to announce the film. Misa makes the Big Daddy Kane. A little bit later, Zarina calls her, but doesn't tell Misa what it's for. It turns into ape shit. And what I love is that the recognition and um, visibility and just elevation for Misa and her story because she is deserved it for a long, long time. Mm. So I'm gonna throw, we're, we're gonna have some, um, so get your questions together, we're gonna do Q&A in a minute. So what's your favorite, I'm, this might get you in trouble, Misa. What's your favorite hip hop song and why? I'm gonna oh, start, great. it's Ready or Not, Fugees, and that just gets me hum, um, just gets me pumped, motivated, and I feel like I can conquer the world anytime I hear Ready or Not by the Fugees. Lisa, go. You down with OPP. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna ask why. <laughs> Misa. <laughs> um, I could never have one favorite hip hop song. It's like which era, you know? Um, I just, I'm a hip hop girl. I love hip hop. So I don't have a favorite, but I'll tell you a song that gets me amped when I need to get motivated and I need to like get on my thing. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm not going to curse, but you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> you know what I have to, and that's I'm a Street Rider by Tupac. Oh. I turn that on, oh, it's over. I'm conquering everything wow. that day. Wow. <laughs> California. Oh. <laughs> West Side. Okay, Farrah? Um, being from California before I moved to New York, I, I love some Snoop Dogg. Okay. So, gin and juice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to ask why on that one anyway. Okay, do we have any questions from the crowd? Hello, beautiful ladies. Um, I don't even know if I have a question. I just want you ladies to know that I am so inspired. Like, oh my God, Thank women you. of color fashion, hip-hop, production. All my life, I'm like, okay, what do I do? I went to school for TV production. I'm like, okay, I like to create, but I also love fashion. How do I combine that into one? So I have a question for you, Lisa. How did you come up with the remix? Like, what was your trigger? What's your name? Savannah, I'm sorry. Hi, Savannah. No, don't, Hi. Never, don't say you're sorry. What's your name? Savannah. Nice to meet you. What do you do, Savannah? I am a case manager. I work with adults who have different disabilities. That's fantastic. No, thank, thank you for your service. Yeah. Um, several years ago, I wanted to do a doc about women in hip hop, because I've always have been intrigued by all these amazing women behind the scenes that nobody knew about. And that project didn't come to fruition. That was like, I don't know, seven years ago. Um, and I just see so many hip hop docs and narratives that are told mostly from a male perspective. And when this opportunity came up to, um, to pitch to Tribeca and MCM, I was just like, this is like the, one of the most important parts, like how, how we look, why we dress a certain way. And I just felt like this is, this is a character I couldn't find before. And, and 
character, not in a negative way, but in the guide to our, you know, our protagonist uh, for the story at, at a time when resetting the narrative to make certain that it is inclusive is more important, I think, than ever before. I love it. You ladies had a problem figuring out the I made it moment. You all have made it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. So um, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, Your name? Yanni. Um, I'm from Syracuse University. I'm a sophomore. She's as well. And uh, we're in fashion design. Uh, so I'm an entrepreneur, entrepreneur myself, and I want to ask what's one piece of advice you'd give to someone who's, I guess you say, like trying to get their name out there while still young? You know what I'm going to say. Believe in yourself. And believe in your art, believe in your craft. You're at Syracuse. You're getting the knowledge that you need. And now you just have to be courageous and dream big and don't let anything be an obstacle for you. Where there's an obstacle, there's also a hidden opportunity. Thank you. I would also just add the path that you think is going to be like this, it goes like this. And even though you're veering this way, don't, don't get discouraged, because eventually you'll get back this way and that way. It's, it's never going to be a straight path, but if you keep with it, you'll get there. And I want to add to that. And anything that you choose to do is going to be challenging times. It's going to be difficult, and the path is going to be wild and crazy many times. So at least you're doing, you will have those experiences doing something that you love and that you're passionate about, and it makes it all worth it. Hello ladies, my name is Victoria, I'm a stylist, and I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. My question is for Misa. In the film, it said that you had to make the decision between giving up your house or your career. Mm -hmm. Mentally, what did you have, like, what was your thought process to choose your career over having a place for you and your children? Because I'm a teenage mom, too. My son is 13. So okay. um, as a stylist, I have to leave out of town a lot and leave him at home. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know what was your thought process for that decision? Uh, it was a huge sacrifice. It was one of the most difficult decisions I ever had to make in my life. And it was a challenging process. Um, especially in the beginning. But with huge sacrifice comes huge reward. And I've been committed to my career and to my passions since I started in this business. And I wasn't going to give up at that moment. And so I knew that once I got over that hump after making that sacrifice, I didn't know what was on the other side. But look what was on the other side, girl. <laughs> And in, in other words, don't let fear cripple you. Yeah, don't let fear cripple you. And that, 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 that was a personal decision, but I think that we all have those moments in our life when we have to make like the, a, a really scary decision where you don't, where you'll be judged or, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen. And so, you know, just having faith, I'm very spiritual. I always put God first and I knew that I would be okay. And I didn't know what, how I was going to be okay, but I just had this feeling that I knew it. And I, I stood with that and I prayed every day and I cried every day and it was really difficult. I'm going to be honest with you, but I made it through. And so here I am today talking to you about a film that I'm in after that moment. <laughs> I, I have a personal question because I am a fan. Um, we're from the same kind of area, the Bronx, Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. And in the film, your, your friend said, Misa's is kind of always over the top. Mm -hmm. how, how did you overcome feeling like you could be who you were, even at a younger age? Like you deserve to dress the way you d dress and not be the stereotype type of kid from the hood. You know... It's amazing how your experience and the hardships and the challenges that you go through become sort of like what you teach to the world. And so for me, it was difficult growing up first at home because um, my parents, well, my mother is Japanese and West Indian Jamaican and they're very strict. That's why you have the question. Yes. Yeah, so you already know. And um, everything about who, how I wanted to express myself was sort of shunned or like, why don't you do this? You shouldn't do that. Why do you, you know? Um, and in my case, rebellion saved me because 
this was gonna be a part of my career. So I kind of rebelled against the status quo and um, I continue to do so. <laughs> what is the time, what time is it? Good afternoon, ladies. Um, my name is David Galindo and I am a clothing designer. I own my own business as far as designing clothes and um, from the Bay Area and I'm super duper inspired, Misa. Um, uh, the three of you, this film is amazing. And my question is, how do I get a copy of it, really? <laughs> but to add a little context to it, the name of my company is Decorate Our Home Planet. I'm from the Bay Area, as I was saying, and we're very green out there. But I grew up on hip hop. I mean, I just, I can't say enough. We had CMC, which was the Channel 31 for us. Okay. and. Um, I wanted to give back and contribute to the hip hop community, but with a Bay Area spin from green streetwear, which is what we do. Everything is sustainably made, made um, locally, um, and we plant three trees. And um, I felt compelled to speak today because um, I'm also a, a school teacher, and you had brought up the question about how do we keep the gentrification of hip hop um, from happening, and I feel like uh, Misa, I, I was lucky enough to meet Dapper Dan last year, and 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 now getting to meet you, I feel like I'm a, I guess a prodigy of yours or a, a result of of what you've contributed to it. And as a school teacher, um, I'm trying to give back as well, and I think that that's what we have to do. I mean, it's a it's a moving a mount, mountain one pebble at a time. It's a long haul, but I think it's possible and feasible if, you know, because I just jumped right in. I mean, I literally bought my ticket last night at like 8.58 p.m., flew here, and was very, they were very nice to me, and I, I almost didn't get to see you guys, so I think it's kind of like a godsend of sort. But I really do want a copy of that <laughs> film because, so d Decorate Our Home Planet deals. How much cash you got on you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Eric B. and Rakim. <laughs> um, but the, so, so just to kind of wrap it up, but the DOHP, uh, Decorate Our Home Planet, we call it dope. And it was homage to hip hop. I mean, if, even if you go on to our, uh, the, the little blurb on, on the Instagram, it says, drop in science, force for good, hip hop. And so this was my take on it. And like I said, to meet you today is just so just like, who, like, I, I just was like, you're always wondering who, who, who came up with it or who created it or who, who gave us that inspiration, and then you put a face on it. So you're like, oh. And that's why when, when you passed by and I was like, I took a picture of, the, of the, um, the, the Carters last year, and I was wondering about the design, and now I'm like, oh my gosh. It, it just, I feel like it came full circle. And so I want to give back if there's an possibility to get a copy of the film by it. I so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extract the question so from Ed. And we're, Sorry, and we're I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like going off. Like, this is all organic. Can't cash at this. <laughs> but to, but to answer your question, very soon okay. we will be announcing our distribution, which is, is pretty phenomenal. So please stay tuned. For you guys sure. are lucky. Okay, we have one more right here. Hi, my name is Emily Goldberg. I, I'm also from Syracuse University. I'm a fashion design major, but um, styling is my dream. So Misa, I had a question. How have you um, balanced honoring your client's style with your own personal style? And was there ever a time when you had to sacrifice what you thought was right to um, make your client satisfied? Oh, yeah. Um, styling. It's so personal, and um, working with clients, it's important, as I said, to connect with them and to understand who, how they want to show up in the world, especially uh, musicians, because it's their image that they're selling along with the music. And so, are there? So that's number one. So being able to like really connect and listen and bring and and create from that place, I think really in in, in any type of fashion styling, but, you know, create from that place. And yes, I have, you know, I've had situations where clients wanted to do something a certain way. And instead of being upset or shunning it, I would get into their mind to see why do they want to do it that way. 
and why does it, how does it make them feel like, and really understand why, why? Because you just assume like, oh, she always wants to wear that, or she, we, I'm trying to, you know, introduce her or him into to something new. But no, understand why that makes them feel special, and then from that place, you can build on that idea, and then maybe bring something back to them that they will connect with. But if you don't have time for that, you have to, you have to understand that building a relationship is a process and it's a journey, and you pick your battles. The only time that I get that I, I would be adamant about not going with something if I thought it was totally bad and it didn't look good on them. Not because of the style, but because of maybe like the fit or the color or technical things that I know about fashion style and that they may not be aware of. You're welcome. We have time for one more question. Oh. Hi. Is it on? There you go. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm actually a DJ of 19 years and I live in Los Angeles. Spinderella was my mentor way back in the day. And I wanted to ask, the movie was amazing, thank you. Um, creatively, how did you choose who to focus on? I thought every story was really moving. Um, I'm sure there's so many people to choose from that are behind the scenes and have been for many years. How did you choose that? And then second part of this, sorry, is do you feel like with all the throwbacks in fashion to the 90s and now I think the 80s are really <laughs> making a move in fashion um, and just this, in our society with uh, light being shown on a lot of people behind the scenes and people of color, that more light will be shown in fashion, bringing designers and um, you know, the culture creators to the forefront. I guess it's for all of you. I would say for the, the first part of your question, how did we decide? Um, documentary filmmaking is definitely a process and it's an ex exploratory process. So we started out with an idea of what we want, but then as we film and as other stories become part of our, our um, footage, things just, it's trial and error. We put people in, we took people out, we had some people going in and out every other day trying to <laughs> figure out who's gonna work and it was really a collaborative process with our entire team to get the stories in there and see that they organically fit and that they had the message we were trying to relay. But it's, it, for documentaries, it's never what you think you're going to do at the start. It always ends up being something else. And I think in this case, we were very lucky that it just got better as we kept moving forward and interviewing more people. I think the intention was always important for us was to show this journey, this three-act structure of the rise, fall, but the rise. Because that's a note we want people to leave this film on, which is about dreams do come true, you know, about the, 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 the wellspring of what creativity and your commitment to your creativity can bring to your professional career, but more importantly to your personal growth. And, and so the voices that talk about the origins, these magical moments, the ascendancy of the craft were the ones that we, we really, you know, put around the journey that we took folks on. So I just want to say, um, before we say thank you to you guys, ladies, um, there's four people who made it really possible for this t event to happen today. So number one, one is um, Ethan Miller. He couldn't be here today. Ethan Miller is a head agent at IMG, and he also started The Fabric. And there is an article about him just last week in the Washington Post, so please go look for it. And he is, um, so I'm just going to give it a quote. Fashion is dictating what popular culture thinks about itself with the images we put out. It's not just who's in front of the cameras that's important, but also who's behind it. The Fabric lets these brands know there are a plethora of black creatives to tap into and help avoid these problems. So what The Fabric is, and you can look, up it, on, look it up on Instagram, it connects black photographers with black lighting directors. Um, um, and it introduces black stylists to black makeup artists, which has also been a problem in the past. So number one, Ethan was um, gracious enough to help me meet Judy Matz. Please say hi, Judy, to the masses. She's very low key, but she's so awesome. She's the executive director of global programming here at IMG. I want to say thank you to Ivan Bart, and also thank you to Bazoma St. John, who could not be here. She's the chief marketing officer at William Morris Endeavor and IMG, and she helps me dream and appreciate the black skin that I'm in. She also makes it cool to wear sequins on a Tuesday. So um, she, you know, she just is unapologetically black, and just through social media alone, Bazoma St. John, um, affectionately known as Vaz, she really makes black girls feel like they belong in this world. So I just want to say thank you, number one, to the change agent called WME and IMG. You guys rock. Judy, 
you're amazing. You're just so open to this event happening. And for the entrepreneurs in the room, showing up, as Misa would tell you, showing up is, is just half the battle, right? You just have to be there. You have to be present and be open and mindful. Ladies, thank you so much for this, for being here. Jan, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Misa, Lisa, Farah. We can't wait to watch this over and over and over and over. Binge watch it at home. <laughs> um, but if you got some cash. If you got some cash. <laughs> and we just want to say thank you so much for um, championing this fight in diversity, inclusion, and representation. Because those are all three very separate things. And we look forward to seeing where the remix Hip Hop X Fashion is going. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And have a great afternoon. Happy fashion. Thank, thank you so much.